Welcome. Welcome, everybody. That's wonderful. And we have two groups. Of, we have two different groups of people. It's wonderful to see you all here. So just to tell you what the purpose, I'll start out with the vision. Climate restoration by 2050 becomes the overarching goal of climate action by the end of this decade. That's our vision. Climate restoration by 2050 becomes the overarching goal of climate action by the end of this decade. And our mission is to generate the social license and the political will to restore the climate. So that pretty much says it all. Um, two people I'd like to introduce you to. I would love to have, I would love it if we all could introduce ourselves, particularly the new people to these call this call. Um, we would like you first, if you would, put your name and your, maybe where you're from and your contact information in the chat. We would love to reach out to you after the call today. Um, these are weekly calls and we would love you to be part of this community if this something, if this turns out to be something that really lights you up. Um, in line with that, I'd like to introduce you to um, three people actually, our board chair, Alan Hyman. Do you wanna just raise your hand, Alan? That's our board chair, Alan Hyman. Do you have a sentence or anything to welcome people? Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, uh, great uh, seeing all the numbers. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And to the two people who are on the board of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, who stepped up to organize and to shepherd the community of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, Melanie Trent and Joan Bordeaux. Melanie, um, is there something you would like to say? Well, I'm just really excited to see everyone today. And I'm just, it's so inspiring to me to know that we actually are on a road to restore our climate and that it's possible. And, uh, it's just something that I'm I'm living into day after day, and I'm I'm really proud and pleased to engage here. Beautiful, thank you. Um, and Joan. Well, uh, pretty much Melanie said it for me, but I am thrilled that you're all here, and that we're partners in this. Thank you so much. Beautiful. So you might want to open up your chat. People are um, listing where, who they are, where they come from, and putting their um, information there. So, and, and if we have links we want to share with you during this, we'll put them there also. Now I'd like to introduce you to, many of you know him, Peter Fakowski. He's the founder of the whole field of climate restoration. Um, and his vision, why he introduced it, was he lives inside a commitment to leave a, a world that we're proud of to our children. And the founder series started, and we wanted to get the founder to speak first. And he graciously accepted, of course. Um, um, and for those of you he, who don't know, he's also written a book, maybe everyone does. And big tada we finally have the audio book available it's available for pre-order i think it's going to be available available in a couple of weeks on amazon there are probably other book sites as well ah thank you peter you put that up that's beautiful <laughs> carol did you want to say something about that i was just going to say it was released officially yesterday ah great and I'd like to introduce you to Carol Douglas also, who is Peter's co-author. And um, Carol, I want to give you freedom to uh, raise your hand if you have something to add as the co-author at any time. But we asked him because, you know, you read that book on climate restoration, although it's a 
what I love about it is, is it's so simple. And it's, he writes it, they write it. So it's so available for people like me who don't have a deep scientific background. So it's available for me to get. Um, when I met, well, I've known Peter for years, but uh, seven years ago, he, he did a, a slide deck for me. And at the end of it, it was like the nickel drop. We can restore the climate. And I told them, wow, I've never heard this before. I'm on board for the duration for this. But, but the possibility of this is Peter will talk a little bit, but he's here to answer your questions, your yeah buts, your how abouts, and your I don't quite understand X. And why do you say Y? Or all like that. So with no further ado, Peter, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, it's great to see a big crowd here. Um, thank you for, I see you're coming from lots of different places, from uh, uh, the Philippines, from Alaska, and many places that have scrolled off my screen. Amazing. So uh, Ju Julia asked me to do a three to five minute summary of the whole Bible of climate restoration. So um, I'll try to do it standing on one foot. Uh, <laughs> but I've got notes here. So, uh, but save your questions because most of the hour is for your, your questions. And I think we'll all learn from the questions. The, the goal here is, yeah, for you to understand, but be looking at sharing it because the uh, what you'll see at the very end is climate restoration isn't a technical problem, amazingly, despite everything you hear in the news. And I keep on getting bombarded with new technologies, new climate technologies. Uh, the issue is just a, uh, a social issue of deciding that we want to restore the climate. Uh, the, I, I've been talking recently about uh, Earth Day because uh, we have uh, a number of us have established Humanity Day, which is six months opposite Earth Day. And Earth Day is very interesting because I remember growing up in Washington, D.C. and seeing, uh, I just got used to the fact back in the 60s, the, the Potomac River was a, a mess. It stunk. You would never touch it without washing your hands afterwards. And as a 10-year-old, that's just the way it was. That's mm -hmm. the way it was always going to be. I knew it had been clean. We, people complained about it. But it never occurred to us that we could clean it. And then in 1970, in April, there was Earth Day, and people talked about the Earth. And people said, well, wait a minute, this is our Earth, we could take care of it. By the end of that year, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. And by the time I finished college, 10 years later, uh, there were people ref uh, swimming in the reflecting pool, which is where the Hudson River, uh, where the Potomac River meets downtown. Um, and I can speak for myself that I never expected that. It just never occurred to me that we could clean up the rivers. You know, the the Erie uh, Lake Erie was burning occasionally, and like it, the question was how quickly would it get worse? No one asked when I was a kid if we could clean it. Um, mm. The technology for cleaning it up is not a big deal. It's a matter of saying we're going to clean it up, and if you find someone polluting the lake then tell us and we'll tell them to stop polluting it. So, so here, here, here's the equivalent in climate. So we're in a climate emergency. You know, all of us have read the news about the wildfires, floods, unbearable heat, collapsing ocean currents. Um, how many of you have heard about the collapsing Atlantic Ocean Current? Oh, oh good, most, okay. <laughs> um, I never know what's in my narrow field of view and what gets outside of it, right? Th that's already happening. Now, think about this. 10 years ago, it wasn't so bad. 10 years ago, we had a, a few wildfires, some of them pretty bad. We had a few super, super hurricanes, right? Every few years, it was something big. 20 years ago, we were just, uh, you know, around the turn of the century, we were just beginning to see spring coming a little bit earlier and fall coming a little later. Um, you know, the orchards, you know, the, the, 
things had changed as compared to now where they're actually here in California, they're having to plant new grapes because the, the vineyards, you can't grow the old grapes in the same places anymore. Um, so 20 years ago, we were just seeing the, the seasons change by three, four, five, six days uh, each year. 30 years ago, we were still debating if global warming was a, a theory that was true or something cooked up by some people from the opposite uh, party. And um, 30, 30, 35 years ago, the UN established its climate work. And so, uh, and they set the goal of stabilizing greenhouse gas levels and eliminating human interference in the climate system. That made sense because at the time, the climate system had not changed. And so the goal was to zero out our impact, zero emissions and so on. Uh, however, today, the, the, if we were to stabilize it today, it would be the perfect climate for dinosaurs again. The, the last time our, our, our atmosphere had this much CO2, humans had not evolved. Humans wouldn't evolve for another 2 million years last time CO2 was this high. And so would we survive? Well, we could find out or we can restore the climate. And again, remember uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. It seemed impossible, but then we just did it. Okay, that's climate restoration. It's, the, it's defined as getting CO2 back to historically safe levels. So back to the level that allowed us to develop, uh, develop agriculture and civilization. And I'll show a graph. Let's see how lucky I am in getting the right graph. I have to wait a moment here. Change. I thought I had it all set up. There it is. Okay. So this is my favorite graph. And if someone has a good graphics person to clean it up, we will would love to get this thing cleaned up. This is the CO2 level in the atmosphere over the last million years. And you can see it going up and down. Um, uh, well, this is a few years old. Today, we're up here in terms of CO2. The UN goal is up here. Um, but you can see over the last million years, CO2 has gone up and down and up and down. The last ice age was 12,000 years ago. That's down here. When you look at that, imagine a mile of ice over New York City, um, over Eugene, Oregon. Uh, uh, I don't remember. I think it was also about a mile over Eugene, Oregon. Um, and then it warmed up. But then um, you can see that nature removed this much CO2 and then put it back in. That's the same amount of CO2 that we need to get out. And that, that's why we're not worried about, is it possible to remove that much CO2? That's been done 10 times in just the last million years. Um, and uh, humans evolved 3 million years ago, or uh, Homo erectus, our, our first ancestors evolved 3 million years ago. So it's relatively recent. Um, and, and that's, that's the, the, it's worth emblazing this graph in your memory. This is what really got me excited when I first saw it. The key thing is the highest level that humans have ever survived is 300 parts per million. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, humans evolved uh, right about this, uh, well, here, somewhere in there. Um, depends on who you ask. I think when I wrote it was it was here and then more science was done and they just they discovered some skeletons from this old. I love science. We say things like they're true and they always change. Anyway, this is, so this is the highest level and we can get the CO2 out. And you might be asking how, and I'll talk briefly about that. The other graph I really want people to memorize is this one. This is CO2 over just the last 12,000 years. So here's the end of the last ice age. You can see CO2 increasing and the planet is warming up from the ice age, the last of the ice is melting, and then we're stable. Agriculture develops, Moses is around here, uh, Jesus is around here, the, uh, um, the Industrial Revolution is here, 
and then you know today we're here and the Paris goal is up here. And then you'd say, well, why is the UN planning on settling CO2 levels way up here? That's crazy, right? Well, it's crazy now, but it wasn't crazy 35 years ago when the UN thought about it. So, um, actually, uh, so in 1992, so this is CO2 again, uh, and this may be the, the last graph I show, that uh, this is CO2 uh, since the Industrial Revolution, 1850, and uh, the 300 parts per million, this is the, the highest level humans have survived, and we passed that in 1920. And um, in 1990, uh, when, when you, the UN created the, the framework for climate change, um, CO2 was about 350, you can see here. And they said, well, if we stabilize it, then uh, we'll be okay. You know, the CO2 would never get above 375 and warming would never get above three quarters of a degree warming, uh, which is what it was in 2000, right? So in 2000, we barely could see any global warming and the UN goal made sense in 1990. It doesn't make any sense anymore. And one of the, the if you, and that's the reason the foundation is here, is we need a grassroots group to tell our officials that it's time to update the UN goals, our, at the US climate goals, to the, uh, the climate that we have today, because it's, it's no longer 1990. And um, so the other thing to see here is um, the, the climate restoration pathway. And I thought not, yeah. The climate restoration pathway it is up and then it comes down to 300 parts per million by 2050. Um, and then goes down a little bit further. The, uh, the exciting thing is global warming, which is now about 1.2, 1 1 somewhere around 1.2 degrees. Some say 1.5 because of the El Nino effect right now. But that go, by 2050, that goes down to about half a degree or three quarters of a degree. If you include the methane oxidation, which we may or may not have time to talk about today, if, depending on what questions you ask, it would be a half degree back to what it was in 1990. What's exciting is this, by the end of the century, warming is back to zero, back to what it was at the beginning of the, at the uh, industrial revolution, back to what it was when we developed agriculture. So this is, this is climate restoration is getting it back down. The thing you'll notice is that the UN uh, has these, they call them pathways. And uh, uh, you know th this top gray one, was the pathway they used uh, until about the most optimistic they offered. Um, and then uh, about five years ago, and then this one, they they improved their modeling and said, well, maybe we could do this, uh, which would take us to uh, um, you know, about, about one and a half degrees. Now, they never offered a zero, a RCP zero. They never offered a pathway that would restore the climate because that would require um, uh, human intervention, interference in the climate system. And there, what they said in 1990 is let's not interfere with the climate system. Didn't occur to them that we already were interfering. And we had to undo our interference. And that's the thing that we're very clear about now. And again, that's the main thrust of what we're doing. So it's time is moving on. Uh, let me so so just a, a quick description of how does how are we going to get this much CO two out mm -hmm. a thousand gigatons? How did nature do it ten times in the last million years? And it's photosynthesis in the ocean. And m many of you have heard me say this a hundred times, but some of you haven't. So uh, we all know that photosynthesis in trees pulls CO two out of the air in the ocean. When the plants die, they sink into the deep ocean where there's no CO2 and where there's no oxygen for the, to rot the, the, the material. And so the carbon stays suspended in the water 
for a hundred thousand years. So it it depends a lot. It varies a lot. You know, here it went down and went back up again. But uh, so what we would do is uh, accelerate the work that nature does to do photosynthesis. Now we know from this graph that nature can do the magnitude, do the thousand gigatons because it's done it. Then you might ask, well, can nature do it fast enough? And the answer is yes. And, and you can see it right here. Um, uh, you see Mount Pinatubo erupted in, 19, in the middle of 91. And the, there's a flat spot for 1992. We actually had net zero because the, the dust and the nutrients from Mount Pinatubo cause enough photosynthesis in the ocean just in the South China Sea. So in about a, a tenth of 1% of the ocean area, it did enough, enough photosynthesis was able to happen to pull all the CO2 out that we were emitting that year, which is 20,000 giga, 20 gigatons. So we can do it. And then the point is nature has been doing this for uh, at least a million years and probably millions of, thousands of millions of years. And so we know it's safe. There's been zero, zero reports of this ocean fertilization uh, giving detrimental impacts. And uh, the, the last point there is, um, uh, can we afford it? And the answer is yes. The, the, the best estimates based on the National Academies of Science report from a year and a half ago is that it would cost uh, considerably less than a billion dollars per year for the whole planet possibly as little as $100 million a year, but in any case, very little. And uh, and that re reports from the National Academy, so it's not a hypo hypothetical thing. Now, the scientist science community have said, well, we're not so sure about that. And you know, if you read about the history of the moonshot, you'll realize that it's all, it's part of being a scientist to be very conservative and say, well, I'm not going to talk about something that's never been done before. So the scientific community was almost universally opposed to the moonshot back in the 60s because they said, this is a waste of money. It's not been proven. You shouldn't be investing money in something that's not proven. Scientists today say the exact same thing. They're the main community that's saying, well, maybe we shouldn't be investing in, in restoring the climate because it's not been proven. Now, if you ask someone who says that, how would you prove it? I've never gotten an answer. I think the only way to prove it is to do it. So that, that's again, why we're here. And with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll take questions because I could go on <laughs> for a long time. But yeah, I think the thank questions you, will be very interesting. Very good, yeah. And if you have a question, just raise your digital hand and take yourself off mute. Carol. Okay, Peter, so standing in 2030, yes. what actions have human beings taken such that by 2030, climate restoration is uh, happening in the world? The governments have taken it on, people have taken it on. What actions do you say uh, we've done? What have we done? Yes. How do we get the word out? How You know, what have we done? Wonderful question, and Carol, no one's ever asked me that one before, so thank you. So in 2030, what do we see? Well, uh, we definitely see CO2 being removed at the 60 gigatons per year that's required. And we definitely see methane being removed and actually methane levels back to pre-industrial, and that's a whole different conversation, but mm -hmm. protecting us from a methane burst. So if the methane burst that's beginning in the Arctic gets serious, the methane oxidation protects us. And then you said, well, what does the government do? Well, I'm a bit of a conservative and uh, we don't know who the next president is gonna be. Um, it might be Biden, it might be somebody else. If it's somebody else, uh, any investment that the government is making in climate is very likely to be stopped. It's just the way politics mm -hmm. goes. And mm -hmm. so, what the government is going to needs to do, and we're going to make sure it does it, is declare that the U.S. is committed to restoring the climate. And they don't need to promise to pay for it with the government. 
uh, we've established the Grandparents Fund for Restoring the Climate. And so, you know, the 71 of us and another 71,000 or 71 million of our friends can pay for it very easily. A um, mm -hmm. billion dollars a year. And if a million Americans decide they want to chip in, that comes up to a dollar a day per, uh, for each of those million. Yeah, for each of those million people. So this it's not this is not a big deal to fund, but we do need the U.S. to stand up and say we're committed to it. That is what will change the thinking uh, in the scientific community for them to say, oh, maybe we should figure this out. Because right now the U.N. says, uh, you know, they meant to say they want to keep humanity alive, but like a frog in a boiling pot of water, <laughs> uh, we're now destined for death, that we need to be jump the frog out of the water. And that that's the thing that we need to have the government do. So uh, yes, so a, a billion dollars a year for the CO2 removal, a billion dollars a year for the methane removal and then uh, committing to uh, take care of our, our kids and our grandkids. Great question. How about, how about for a clear answer? Oh, three things. Okay. Great answer. So I have another piece to add. So what can we do? Okay. But you know, we, us. Yeah. <laughs> what was, is first of all, share about climate restoration. Uh, uh, you can go to my website and sign up for the uh, Grandparents Fund. You can give a, you know, $10 a month or $100 a month or $1,000 a month. Um, uh, we're, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the leadership here is managing that and it's all going to, to this foundation. It's going to uh, get the ocean fertilization started, the methane oxidation started, and the governance board. It's just those four things. And so, uh, but besides the money being useful, it also sends a message again to our government and to scientists that this is something people want. I, I got a message from the head scientist at Citizens Climate Lobby today. And he said, you know, I don't think, as a scientist, I don't think climate restoration is a good thing because, uh, you know, if we reduce the temperature too fast, that might be bad for the environment. He had, <laughs> as a scientist, had no concern for humanity because that's not mentioned in the, in the UN yet. So again, once we say, no, humanity is important, being a physicist, I know scientists are good citizens. And once the society says keeping humanity alive is critical, they'll, they'll move right along with us. So th those are the two things. Thanks. Okay, Roger. Yes. So thank you so much, Mr. Pikowski, what for what you're doing. I'm inspired by it. And I think it's definitely an idea whose time has come. And it is a project that the world requires. I had the, uh, I have the privilege of living in a Denver house district where my legislature, uh, uh, the, the, the woman who's the legislative uh, person is interested in climate change. And I gave her your book last Saturday and she says, oh great. And thank you for the information you sent me over the email. So, this is something that's very exciting to me. I have one question for you, and that is, I think you said that when in, when uh, the Filipino uh, volcano erupted, it only impacted one-tenth of one percent, which was in the South China Sea. Yes. What, what percent of... Uh, ocean iron fertilization uh, is needed throughout the world. Uh, is it closer to 5% or 3%, et cetera? 1% uh, one, one is the number that we use as a benchmark. Uh, you know, reality will make it either easier or more difficult than we expect. Uh, if you extrapolate from the Mount Pinatubo eruption, it would be one third of 1%. But don't say that. That's insane. <laughs> but that's what the numbers come out to. Uh, one percent is the number that we use. And is that one percent over twenty-five years? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, 
that's all my questions. Thank you very oh, much. Good. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank and th you. then uh, adding that to the, the previous question, um, the other thing we can do, if you're interested, is ask your member of Congress to introduce uh, to introduce and endorse the climate restoration resolution. Oh, um, we're we're yes, ma'am, yes, sir. That's what this you're is doing. This is Col this is Colorado, okay, and uh, she's she's probably one of the top three leaders in the Colorado legislature and Senate. Okay, great, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it doesn't matter which legis which legislature you're in. Obviously, the Congress is most important, but every voice that's heard will mo move the scale over. I agree. Great. Thank you. Okay, okay so Lauren. The, yep, Lauren. And one thing I just want to um, say is, can we put the um, Carol the resolution in the chat so people can see the template? Yeah, Lauren. Hi, um, Peter. Thank you so much for um, sharing your past question of restoration. Um, it's really good work and really necessary um, for the environment. And um, I love talking about it and having it shared. And um, yeah, I, I, I wrote something down on my phone. Is um, There we go. Um, so my question was um, regarding the humanities aspect of climate restoration. Um, how do you see climate restoration being in conjunction with uh, native sovereignty and indigenous nations um, as we go through this um, journey of, I think, understanding kind of the land that we're on and like how it, um, interacts and how it heals itself and how we can assist in that, in that healing. Yes. Well, uh, th there's two aspects there, Lauren, uh, with regards to indigenous and First Nations. Um, the first is culturally, um, most of the First Nations are culturally at high risk right now because the climate change is making it almost impossible to grow the native plants they knew they've known how to grow. Sea level is rising, you know, deserts are growing, and so on. So uh, for those of us who want to maintain these ancient cultures, restoring the climate is critical. And conversely, there is no climate justice without restoring the climate, because basically mo almost all the, the only way we're going to survive is with high tech, th those who can live in a high tech civilization. Um, if we If we continue on our uh, the UN goal. So we need to restore. Then um, as far as the environment goes, I think you're asking, you, you're maybe asking about re regenerating environments. And the same thing goes there, that uh, the ecosystems that we know have been around for uh, 12,000 or several million years, depending on <laughs> how far north or south on the globe you live. And um, if we restore the climate, then those ecosystems can will revive. If we don't restore the climate, then that process that typically takes uh, you know, 50,000 years is gonna have to start to develop new ecosystems. I don't think we want that. We, you know, none of us will be around and probably none of our relatives, I'm sure someone's relatives will. So uh, for to save indigenous cultures, and to save the indigenous environments, we need to restore the climate as quickly as possible. And by 2050 is the, the goal that we have. Okay, thank you. Does that clarify it for you, Lauren? Was there something else there? Um. Yeah, I think that was a, a really good summary and I appreciate um, you sharing that. Um, with having climate again impact this, these communities so hard um by um displacement of homelands and all that other stuff that um is a consequence of um kind of how we got here is there effort to collaborate i know um i'm based in california and um we have the the shumash 
Marine Sanctuary coming up. And that's going to be, I think, one of the largest marine sanctuaries in the U.S. And it's all tribal led. And um, there's different aspects of, um, I guess, tribes and nations doing this work all already, like the undamming of the Klamath. And um, they're having like a restoration, you know, six year stretch going into that. And um, is there kind of a section of this work that you guys are kind of dedicating towards learning from a perspective that is tribal led or native led and um, kind of seeing like bridging the two together, you know, like with the, the scientific, the, the policy aspect and the funding versus like people that may not be receiving government funding if right. they're um, not, not tribally like listed, but still doing this kind of work. Lauren, I think you're asking uh, in terms of, of policy, uh, is there a way to listen to the indigenous, the, the First Nations uh, knowledge for policy? Uh, the, you know, uh, of course there is, and we're not focusing on policy. Um, we're focusing on what's the de destination we want to get to. And then um, other people will figure out exactly which policies. Now we talk about using ocean fertilization just because by a factor of 10,000, it's the least expensive and fastest. And we think that's a factor of 10,000 is, is really life and death for humanity. But if, the, if someone has a better way, <laughs> then that's also fine. Um, but uh, what I like about your question is we do, uh, want to include First Nations in the climate restoration conversation. If you have connections there, uh, uh, let's let's get something started. Uh, do, do you have connections, Lauren? Um, I volunteer, I think, um, around and stuff. So I could um, definitely email some re resources right. um, if you'd like to reach out. But yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, someone, perhaps Joan, will will reach out. And Lauren, the, the good news and the bad news is uh, sort of as a tag, you're it. It's your idea. We're going to need you to lead it. So, uh, fat, uh, tighten up your your seatbelt there, because th there's a we'll, we'll support you. But uh, that's the way these things go. If you have a really good idea, which unfortunately this is what happened to me when I started discussing restoring the climate at Citizens Climate Lobby, the, the, the uh, Mark Reynolds, who was heading it up, said, Peter, congratulations, you're in charge of that now. And this is what happened. So, Lauren, I hope that works for you. Peter, before Thank I you. call on the next person, great, Lauren, I just want to say that is it. I love what you just said. If we could put a banner statement it's whatever we can see, that's what we have a choice to be accountable for. And also that, you know, everyone who's doing work on the ground, you know, with regeneration, with all those arenas, they're part of climate restoration. But the, this is the organization that's putting in the, the, the end goal that we want everything that's going on to to um end up with stuff being regenerated etc cetera, etc cetera. that's all part of climate restoration it, it you know and that's what we're committed to is that by the end of this decade all climate action is seen as restoring the climate getting back to the healthy climate that our grandparents etc were um you know honored to and live inside of and took for granted that we don't get to. So, Chip. Yeah, so thank you. Um, my question is a little bit different. It's basically how do we take this idea, which is, of course, a paradigm shift by its very nature, and make it go viral? We live in an era where approximately 40% of the American population is in a state of a full psychotic break. They don't live in reality. 
and they're very reactionary when you try to bring reality to their attention. So I would argue many of the adults of the generation of the people that are on this call are in a way irrelevant, that we have to find a way to get the idea into the younger generations, which can put pressure and motivate people and think of Congress as an afterthought as opposed to the focus. Now, granted, Congress will have to be a player, but getting the idea to sweep the planet, which is what I'm hearing is the primary goal by 2030, is really what I think some specific attention needs to be brought using social media or music or rap or art or whatever. And I'm not of that younger generation that knows how all those tools work, but nonetheless, I do see it happening. And I think that is the question I'm curious how we could address. Great. Well, Chip, sure. I think you addressed it pretty well there. Um, uh, to make it easier, uh, keep in mind that uh, we don't need it funded by Congress. So we don't need to transform Congress in, in order to restore the climate. Uh, you know, we can do it just with the Grandparents Fund and with our foundation. Uh, and now, my observation is conservatives as well as liberals really care deeply about their grandchildren. And so once they see that we actually are restoring the climate, they'll come along and do everything they can possibly do. So uh, the, our approach is, is doing everything at once. So, well, that we have resources for. So you know, Lauren talked about the uh, First Nations, for example. Um, doing that will strengthen everything. And if that takes another year or two, that's how long that will take. Uh, similarly with rap or TikTok or any of those things, that will empower things, but it's not required. So uh, whatever, whatever dance steps you're familiar with, grab a partner and dance, uh, bring people to the foundation and to the uh, Grandparents Fund for Climate Restoration. And as I said that, you can get there on my website. Uh, also, it's, uh, oh my God, what's it, was it? Uh, GCR.fund, grandparentsclimaterestoration.fund. And, and I will also uh, volunteer to assist you with your PowerPointing. So oh my God. You have efficient, visually punchy, um, presentations. Oh, Chip, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Chip, would you put your uh, contact info in the chat and Carol Douglas yeah, Peter will get a hold of you. Carol is, touch. Carol is the head of communications for Climate Rest for the foundation. All right. Y'all um, you. can work together. Oh, that's so the spirit. Chip. Yeah, whatever your dance step is, that's, that's the dance step to take. Yeah. Okay, Alan. Well, Peter, you know, we've interacted in the past, and you know I'm, a, I'm, I'm not an easy sell. Uh, however, a, a after, um, you know, doing a lot more reading of the peer-reviewed uh, literature and talking to a lot of the, the DOE actors that are involved in this and politicians, what I realized is that the majority of people influence what we're doing are, are, are are promoting policies which will work at the margin, but they don't really solve the big problem. And um, if you read the DOE policy, it's full of this language about engaging the native peoples and all that sort of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, if you really want to solve the problem, your ocean fertilization in the open ocean has to work. So my, uh, and I'm not 100% sure it uh, will, but most of the, things I've read, as long as you say, okay, there's a there's a certain fraction of this stuff that gets buried and preserved. It's not going to be 100%, but, that, but that's okay. That just means you have to uh, cycle it more. But, the, but then it becomes a question of international law of can you do uh, this iron fertilization in the open ocean? Um, and, 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 you know, to a first approximation, what the U.S. does doesn't make any difference. It's a question of whether or not the international community does it. <laughs> right. Well, well uh, yeah. So uh, there, is no, there is no international law that regulates uh, ocean fertilization. 
the the Columbia Law School, uh, I forget what it's called, but Climate Law School uh, has certified that, as well as the National Academies of Science. And so uh, it's not really so much the international community because sort of what is the international community? It's us. And again, that's why we've organized the, the Grandparents Fund to actually fund the projects that are doing it. And so one of the other resources that I'm looking for is someone to head up the nonprofit to do the ocean fertilization. There are a couple of people who are prepared to do for-profit versions of it. <clears throat> and that may work, but it has to be led by nonprofits uh, for various political as well as structural reasons. So uh, th did that answer your question, Alan? Uh, yes, I, I, I know that you said that, but I don't think most of the people on the call know that. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. It, it, was there something I need to emphasize, Alan, or did it come across? Um, I, I think you need to emphasize it because um, it's nice to be nice to everybody, but the, at the end of the day, you have to actually make the, do the things that actually make the difference. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. And, and again, if anyone knows someone who would want to head up the nonprofit to do the ocean fertilization as a nonprofit, uh, send them our way. Okay. Ray. Yeah. Well, first, uh, thanks for all you're doing, Peter. And I share the link to your website as often as I can. And I'm wondering, first question is, do you have any uh, international presence of your book? Have you been translating it into other languages or anything like that? And the other thing is, most of what I here about climate change is trying to reduce emissions and not much uh, big talk about getting carbon out of the atmosphere and almost nothing about getting carbon out of the oceans, which is, I think, you know, the biggest thing we need to do, obviously. Yes. And I personally advocate trying to solve climate change, which I think is two part. One is you need to restore atmosphere and oceans to pre-industrial conditions. The other is we have to stop burning hydrocarbon fuels for energy. And both of those things in parallel, I think could get us where we need to go. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I don't hear much about these techniques that you're advocating in mainstream media. Uh, everybody I talk to about it, you know, has never heard of it. Yes. So how do we get mainstream media to start covering these things more? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So uh, we the German version of the book came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, it looks like the English version, except <laughs> the, the, it's all written in German. Uh, and so that's available on Amazon and other booksellers. Uh, we don't have anything else. Uh, we have someone translating the first chapter into Spanish. Uh, but you know, if anyone knows a publisher, a foreign language publisher who wants to do a foreign language version, that would be fantastic to, to have. Um, let's see. How do we get uh, the uh, uh, how do we get the mainstream? To, uh, media to talk about it. Well, that's uh, the strategic work we I've done that we've done says the pathway is with the resolutions that we need to get the 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 sort of the high priesthood of climate to talk about restoration. And um, you know, some of you know that I worked for a year or so with the Vatican and Pope Francis to get them working on climate restoration. Because I figured when it comes to the high priest that the Pope Francis was the highest. What we discovered is that uh, the Vatican really didn't, doesn't have the standing to influence the, the scientific community. So all they were able to do was echo what the scientists say. And of course the echoes, the, the scientists echo what was said by the UN 35 years ago which as you said, Ray, is to reduce emissions, which is good. We, we need to reduce emissions 
we're going to reduce emissions, and that's not going to leave a climate that that's livable. Uh, changing the paradigm is the name of the game, and getting our friends to talk about it, getting our members of Congress to talk about it, uh, getting op-eds in the newspapers, uh, and then ultimately getting uh, the Secretary of Energy to talk about it, and she has once, so we know it's on her agenda, uh, and then to get President Biden. Uh, everything I've seen says that once President Biden says the U.S. is committed to restoring the climate, then we've won. Then it's just uh, the funding will come and the opposition will radically decrease because everyone really wants to restore the climate. Uh, it's just that it goes against the 1990 goal of uh, eliminating human intervention in the climate. So we need, just need to fix that that 35-year-old uh, language. Does the IPCC say anything about restoring the climate back to pre-industrial conditions? Nope, because they thought about it, uh, but they realized that it, that if they did that, they would be in opposition to the UNFCCC, the, the, their boss, the UN framework. The UN framework says we can't intervene. We have to eliminate human intervention in the climate interference in the climate and reducing CO2 40 percent would definitely interfere with the client with the climate so they actually removed any uh, mention of uh, what we call RCP zero which is restoring zero warming not one and a half not two but zero degrees warming is restoration so thank you yeah thank you great question Ray Okay, this may be the last question because I need two minutes at the end, but I just want to underscore something you that you said that um, is already obvious, but you said what what our job is to change the paradigm. Yes. From doing a, a climate adaptation, you know, there's so much great stuff going on out there, but nobody has yet, until the foundation and climate restoration, taken on the niche of, of, of changing the paradigm from all climate action to the goal that we want to end up with. So we're not a be-all for everything. We have taken on this niche. And I just wanted to reiterate that, underscore it. Mark, you may be the last question. Um, can I just ask really quickly, Mark, I think you're on mute. Um, I just want to thank you, Mr. Frankowski. This has actually probably saved my life. Um, I've been, yeah, really depressed about the climate. There's, you know, really nothing we can do. And so, I mean, I've heard of the idea of iron, uh, fertilization of the ocean, and I know it removes large amounts of carbon, but I mean, this solution is essentially instant. I mean, as, as close to instant as you can get and that's uh, i mean just to be able to pivot my my brain worry my brain power to climate restoration as opposed to like oh my god like how are we going to survive this um so that's amazing so thank you very much for that so i'm going really too long but uh oh yeah. thank you Thank yeah. you. We, 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 everyone appreciates that. I think it looks so like my now throughout. So on my question, just express everyone's heartfelt emotions. So thank you. Yeah. So on my question, I'll just put a little support in all the directions. So we're a startup with breakthrough solar, battery, wind turbine, and transportation. Transportation that'll decarbonize all air, land, and sea and uh, do it in a real profitable way because the cost is really low and the supply chain issues go away because we're not making we're not refining metals we are using minerals in a ceramic process with fired ceramic semiconductors and uh, i do have a design for a large trimaran large i mean large enough to put to do and to make and install wind turbines offshore and um, you know we've got multiple designs for vehicles and stuff like that. So it will happen. Um, we are what we're looking for is private investors, 
um, to get us off the ground. Mark, I, Mark, we only have two minutes left. Do you have a question? No, that's it. For Peter? No, no, I don't have a question. I just have input there. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, Mark. So yeah, keep up the good work. All yeah, of that is needed. Yes. Wonderful. Peter, do you have you know, 30 seconds, one minute to uh, wrap up what you've learned here today and uh, carry us forward? Well, uh, it, it, what I'm getting more clear about is the job we have, which the, the questions have illuminated for me that it, it's really changing the paradigm and strategically uh, working with our members of Congress to ask them to do anything. Because as soon as they... Uh, engage in the question of climate restoration, they have to confront um, what Alex confronted, which is, oh my God, I need to do something about this. And at the moment, the scientific community ha is necessarily wedded to the 1990 goal. And we, you know, there's going to be a handful of members of Congress who will step up to the plate and say, okay, good, I'll, I'll stand in front and make this thing happen. So uh, we, we, we can do that, again, uh, talking to your members of Congress and uh, putting your names, in, uh, on endorse the resolution on my website, but also go to the Grandparents Fund and help fund it. Because the thing is, once we have 20,000 of us funding climate restoration, people like Bill Gates and Michael Bloomberg, they will join us. They have grandkids too. Mike, uh, Bill Gates got his first granddaughter in April, but uh, just like the members of Congress, they're going to be waiting to for uh, first movers like ourselves, so they they don't be embarrassed by going beyond what the UN said thirty five years ago. Thank you, Peter. So I it just in closing, two things. Number one, you are invited to uh, join our weekly calls if they're at this time. And they are to um, inspire the community to take action around climate restoration. So we'd like to invite you to join the community on a regular basis. People don't come every week. It's not like a workshop or something you have to come to every week. But, but um, find a community. This is a community for you to be at work in and to be empowered by. The second thing I'd like to do is turn it over just for a moment for Carol Douglas, Peter's co-author, to tell us who is the speaker for next month, which is, I believe, October 18th, will be our next founder series. I uh, Thanks. I think it's the 11th, October okay. 11th. It's always the second Wednesday of the month. And the other day, the other Wednesdays are regular um, climate restoration community calls. And coming up is going to be Victor Smetacek. So if you've read, if you haven't read our book, that name may be new, but he is a phenomenal scientist, one of the leading oceanographers and marine biologists of our time. He's, um, he's elder now, and he ran a lot of the early um, he was very skeptical about OIF until he ran a bunch of expeditions into the Southern Oceans in the 90s and um, knows the potential and the risks and the not risks, you know, and why it's not really risky very, very well. He's a delight to, to listen to. And the following, the following month, um, November 8th, will be... Um, we're, we're really honored to have a senator, state senator from California, Dave Cortese, who sponsored the first um, state resolution that passed unanimously in the state Senate uh, for climate restoration. So he'll talk about um, his work in climate restoration and the process and um, he's a wonderful speaker. I'm sure both of these will be well worth inviting everybody you know to. So good. And if you put your your information into the chat, we'll we'll be in communication with you also about all of this. So I just want to thank everybody for showing up. This has been a beautiful, robust discussion. I hope you've lived uh, left with more questions than you came with. Those are your questions to grow into and to take action from. 
and have a great evening. Say, could somebody capture and send out the chat stream, please? I, I'm trying to do it myself. I know how to, I used to know how to do it, but I couldn't get it. So are we going to get the chat stream? That'll be really helpful. It has all kinds Melanie, of references. Melanie, do you have an answer to that? Yes, hmm. the chat. I, I've just done the notes. I've saved it. People who were here. Go ahead, Carol. Okay. Yes, it's saved and it will. Um, it's the one saved. That was here. Um, but I believe if you put your name in, to the chat with your contact information, then it will go out to you. Okay, well, we've got like three seconds left, so uh, I'm not sure you're going to Look gonna at three dots out. at the bottom. Look at three dots at the bottom. Yeah, I got that. It says save and, chat, and I do it, and, but I can't uh, send it to myself, so I need somebody else to send it to myself. Oh, it become. I think it, sent, it sent, saves it as a separate document on your computer. All right, well, maybe it's there. But anyhow, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it goes uh, to a file in Zoom. Thank you, oh, everyone. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Hi. And, good and to Bob see you. Here, uh, Thank Bob, you. I'll, I'll take your question while we're uh, saying goodbye. Go, if you have a quick question, Bob. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, climate restoration is uh, my purpose, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. I've given away 20 some. Uh, copies of your book uh, and uh, getting the word out in every way I can. My question has to do with your effort for a climate restoration resolution. What's the status? What's, what progress has been made? What do you see happening over the next year, two years? Okay. Yeah, so the climate restoration resolution, uh, it's on my website so you can get the language of it. It was passed in the California Senate in July uh, with uh, no opposition. And we're now working to get it introduced into Congress. And we're looking you know, for a, a member of Congress who will introduce it. Uh, uh, be best if it were a Republican and a Democrat co-introducing co it. They call it an initial co-sponsor. And um, it, at the moment, we don't have anyone one of my favorite members of Congress here in Silicon Valley has said, uh, asked us to get a number of climate organizations to endorse it, and then she would endorse it, which is a very smart thing for her to ask. And so if any of you have contacts in uh, environmental organizations, uh, even if it's just the your local 350.org, we're, uh, we're rounding up it both individ, in, individual endorsements as well as group endorsements. And that, uh, once there's a fair number of those, I don't know what number it will be, uh, then it, it should be pretty easy to get it introduced in Congress. And then uh, we'll push for a while to get members of Congress. The, the way it works in Congress, you know, you always think it's about the vote, but in Congress really it's before the vote for weeks members of Congress and their constituents will ask others to co-sponsor a bill, which commits them ahead of time to, to supporting it. And that's how Congress knows to move it forward. So we'll be asking individuals to ask your member of Congress to co-sponsor the resolution in Congress. There is a Democratic Law Climate Caucus in the Congress. Um, I was just dropping off flyers for them on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. There is a Republican Climate Caucus, and there is a bipartisan, I just saw today, that something about a bipartisan Climate Caucus being revived. So it's worth checking those out. Right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, any, Thanks, anyone everyone. available to do that? Uh, we want to do that. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Everyone, go get some dinner. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody.